Hi, David. How are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm well. My name is Leah and the channel is Common Sense Ethics. And today I have David Feidler as my guest. He is a philosopher who writes about how classical and Renaissance ideas can contribute to today's world. And he is the author of several books and also an advisor to Plato's Academy Center in Athens. His most recent book, Breakfast with Seneca, is um, on the philosopher Seneca and has been published in 15 languages. Which languages has it been published in? Oh, um, everything from Russia, Russian to Chinese, uh, Brazilian Portuguese, European Portuguese, Spanish, uh, Lithuanian, oh. Turkish. The list goes on. It's really yeah, a big surprise. Yeah. Well, congratulations. And I have yet to read it, but I would like to. <laughs> I always have so many books on my reading list. Um, and he is currently writing a new book about how ideas from the Renaissance can enhance our world today. So David and I are going to discuss uh, ancient philosophical ideas about beauty and why beauty is important to leading a happy life. And how by understanding the principles of beauty, it's possible for people to create outstanding works of art and architecture. So, David, let's jump right in unless you have anything to add before we start. No, nope, we can um, go right ahead and start. Right. So you recently wrote an article on your website. Why don't you go ahead and plug your website? <laughs> uh, it's called Living Ideas Journal. Yeah. And um, the article was titled How Beauty Can Save the World. And you pointed out in that article um, that many people today think that beauty is subjective or in the eye of the beholder. And that, um, that sort of dates back to David Hume in the 1700s. Um, but in ancient philosophy, um, beauty was considered to be an objective quality of nature. And can you explain what ancient philosophers really meant by the term beauty? For 2,000 years, uh, starting with the ancient Greek philosophers, people thought that beauty was an objective aspect of nature. And only in the 1700s did people start to think that beauty was a feeling or a sentiment or that it might be subjective in some way. And of course, we all respond to beauty individually. Uh, real beauty also, um, it is something that we feel sometimes in a mysterious way, but that doesn't mean that beauty is only subjective. and Another problem, too, in like defining this is that there are a lot of different types of beauty. There's physical beauty, moral beauty, and uh, even mathematical beauty. And sometimes these, these even overlap. So it's really essential to understand what kind of uh, beauty we're talking about. And in this discussion, uh, I'm going to be talking mainly about the ancient Greek idea of beauty, which is very highly specific. And uh, most people... Uh, who say that beauty is subjective, don't even know what this Greek idea of beauty is. So we're really talking about different things. And the Greek idea ultimately goes back to Pythagoras, who was the first person to call himself a philosopher, a lover of wisdom. And Pythagoras was also a mathematician. And there's a very well-established tradition that he was the first person to call the universe a cosmos. And what the word cosmos means is beautiful order. Uh, cosmos refers to uh, beauty and an equal element of order. So it's the root of our word cosmetic, which also refers to beauty. So Pythagoras, um, for Pythagoras, the world is beautiful. It's a beautiful order. Uh, the Pythagoreans were also very interested in the study of proportion and harmony. And they believed it's because of proportion and harmony, which exists in living things and natural structures, that the world itself is beautiful. Uh, another related concept is harmony or harmonia, which uh, literally means fitting together in Greek. And this means fitting together through proportion. So when beauty arises in natural forms, uh, where parts are integrated into a whole by um, proportion or harmonious relationships. This was the Pythagorean idea. And maybe this sounds a little abstract, but it really isn't uh, because <clears throat> we can actually see this beauty 
when we look at, say, like a flower or a snowflake or a galaxy or a butterfly, uh, all of these forms are cosmic in the Greek sense. They radiate beauty because they physically embody whole part relationships based on proportion and harmony. So this is what the Greeks actually understood about why beauty exists in nature. And uh, they were quite correct in my view to say that this kind of beauty is objective. There's nothing subjective about it. And that's the main kind of beauty that I'd like to discuss today. Uh, if that's, if that's okay with you. Sure. Okay. And so, uh, Leah, as you know, uh, philosophers and uh, even ancient philosophers often disagree with one another. And I don't know why. Uh, maybe philosophers are just the most disagreeable people on earth, <laughs> possibly. <laughs> but what's amazing about this is that all the major Greek philosophers agreed with this definition of beauty. Uh, they agreed that it's uh, a proportional harmony between the parts making up a whole. And uh, the Pythagoreans defined it this way, uh, which was um, accepted by Plato, who was a Pythagorean also. So that's not very surprising. Uh, but it was also accepted by Aristotle, uh, who uh, was definitely not a Pythagorean. And this definition was accepted by the Stoics, too. So having all of those uh, philosophers agree about the definition of beauty is quite significant, really. And um, on the other hand, uh, the idea that beauty is based on proportion was a fundamental idea of ancient Greek culture as a whole, I think, because we can see it reflected in all their art and uh, architecture. Right. And ultimately, the source of all beauty is the beauty that we find in nature. So artists copy that. And artists and architects uh, would also draw upon the harmonies and proportions that give rise to beauty in nature. So their works would be beautiful and harmonious too. So uh, one thing I'm wondering is whether you've ever heard of this idea that it's possible to use mathematical proportions and harmony to create beautiful buildings and art. Is that a concept that you've come across in your reading at all? Yeah, but doesn't that have to do with the golden ratio? And didn't you say that was misrepresented? <laughs> well, it, uh, actually, different proportions in nature, right? And the golden ratio is right. is one of them. Uh, there's right. a lot of misinformation right. about that, which uh, you know we can get into. But this approach of uh, using geometrical harmonies was taught by artists, sculptors, and architects in the ancient world, but it's hardly ever taught in colleges today. Even though this knowledge never died out, there are still some people who know how to do this today, but it's hardly ever taught in architecture or art schools. And uh, I think one of the problems for artists today is that if beauty really is subjective and there's no objectivity, then there are no principles behind beauty. So there's nothing to guide their work. So their own work then becomes very individualistic and subjective. and uh, for most artists and architects, we now live in a world where there are few guiding principles. And because of that, art and architecture has become much less beautiful than it was, say, in the Renaissance, uh, I think. Um, but there's one other thing I'd like to mention uh, about beauty and nature and art. Uh, and this is the Greek concept of symmetry. Uh, and the Greek word uh, symmetria. Yeah. Uh, is different, actually, from our modern idea of symmetry. Our modern idea of symmetry is like bilateral or mere symmetry. But yeah. for uh, the ancient Greeks, they had something different in mind. Uh, in Greek, symmetria means uh, with a common measure. And it describes something in which all the parts are unified together harmoniously through a common proportion. So in the original meanings, Symmetry is the common proportion that links the parts together into a unified whole, and it also gives birth to, to beauty. Um, I do have an example of this 
from architecture, the ancient architect Vitruvius said that this kind of uh, symmetria or common proportion was essential for creating beautiful buildings. And we can see this in the design of the Parthenon. So I have a slide of this. And the top level of the Parthenon has the exact ratio of four to nine. Yeah. And that's also the ratio of the front area of the temple, which is a four to nine rectangle. And if a column has a diameter of four units, then the spacing between the columns from the center is nine units. So the entire structure of the Parthenon is unified by this single ratio of four to nine, which integrates all the parts harmoniously into a beautiful whole. So again, this is, you know, this common Greek concept of things being linked together through a common ratio. And uh, a good example of this uh, yeah. that is sort of like close at hand is that uh, you can see this in the proportion of your finger bones or phalanges, which are in continuous geometrical proportion. This is very hard to show on Zoom, so I'll project. I'll project like uh, <clears throat> an image show, showing like an X-ray. But basically, uh, you have these phalanges or, or bones in your hand, and this length is right. to this length as this length is to this length as this length is to this length. So that means that they're actually in continuous geometrical proportion. Um, and it's not just any proportion, but it is the golden ratio, which has all kinds of uh, unique mathematical uh, properties. And as we were talking about before, there's a lot of you know, bad misinformation about the golden right. ratio on the internet. So, you know, if you Google it or something, you'll see people imposing like golden spirals on the face of the Mona Lisa or, <laughs> you know, ancient Greek temples and things like that. So if you want to learn about these, these things, which are actually real, uh, it's very important to have reliable sources. Uh, and it's also important to know that uh, there are several uh, important ratios used in both nature and art. It's not just the golden right. ratio. But uh, the golden ratio or the, the fee ratio, it is important. And it was known by the ancient Greeks. It's even discussed in the elements of, of Euclid. And um, what is uh, significant about it, I have a very high-tech uh, demonstration <laughs> of it here. So if you imagine this to be a line, then uh, this this red line here is the golden ratio division of, of the line. And what happens is that it's the only place where you can divide a line where the small part of the small part is to the larger yeah. part as the larger part is to the entire whole, if that makes sense. Yeah, makes so sense. it's the only place where you can make that uh division and you can do that very easily um, using geometry but uh, the ultimate question and so this is the exact same ratio in the placement of your finger bones it's this continuous geometrical proportion and the question is uh, why does this mathematical ratio appear in nature like in the bones of your hand and the reason why it appears in living forms is because it's an ideal way of uh, relating the part to the larger whole or integrating the parts within a larger whole. So ultimately, the reason that we have this ratio in our hands is because it allows our hands to function and open and close, you know, perfectly because of the geometry. And so uh, yeah. that allows our hands to open and close in the best possible way. And when you start talking about the best possible way, by definition, that's something that is very good. It let, yeah. lets it work in the best possible yeah. way. So here we can see a relationship between harmony, proportion, symmetry, it's symmetry, it's the same proportion, and goodness, because the golden ratio lets our hands work in the best possible way. Yeah, that's an interesting example. Wow. <laughs> it's not the only one either. Uh, I just picked one, you know, out yeah. of, you know, different examples, but. 
Yeah, very good. Um, should we move on? Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. Okay. Um, we often hear the phrase, the good, the true, and the beautiful. This idea goes back to Plato. You mentioned in your article on beauty that later in the Renaissance, um, Francesco Petrarch described beauty as the face of the good made visible. Would you give us a little more history and background about this idea of the beautiful and how it relates to what is true and good? Sure. Um, that's very interesting. And it's not something that people really write about too often. Um but you're right, the idea of the good, the true, and the beautiful goes back to Plato. These are all very important ideas in Plato's thought. Um, but the good, the true, and the beautiful only became a kind of philosophical slogan in the Renaissance when it was created by uh, Marsilio Ficino, who was the first to translate Plato's writings into Latin. And uh, thanks to you, uh, Leah, I've been thinking this over, and I've concluded that I think there are like three main ways that we can look at goodness, truth, and beauty. And the first way that we can look at them is probably the most common today. So this is the idea that truth, goodness, and beauty are judgments and possibly subjective judgments. So someone might say that uh, that sounds good to me, or that sounds true, or maybe they might be in a store and they might say, well, that looks good. It's beautiful. I'll take it. And those are judgments. Uh, philosophers also make judgments about whether something is good, true, or beautiful, and this is just normal human behavior. Now, the second way we can look at them uh, is that goodness, truth, and beauty are not just judgments, but they're objective aspects of the deepest nature of reality. And this is the Platonic view. And in this Platonic view, uh, goodness beauty and truth are the deepest aspects of reality, which our minds are drawn to. And yeah. um, then, you know, we aim for those in our life and work. And while this is a platonic view, it's it's not only platonic. For example, the Stoics also believe that truth, goodness, and beauty are objective things that we should aim for in life. Right. Right. Um, a third way of looking at this is that beauty, truth, and goodness are things that we can dr directly experience as well. Right. And I think all of these, you know, they can all be true at the same time. Right. So uh, they can be judgments we make. They can also be objective realities in the platonic sense. And they can be things that we actually experience in a tangible or maybe a spiritual way. Uh, which can be very profound and even life-changing experience. So all of these things can be true. Uh, personally, though, I think the Platonic view that truth, beauty, and goodness are objective and that they are among the deepest aspects of reality that are worth striving for is the most interesting idea. And uh, maybe I'm somewhat... I'm sorry. Plato thought that there were that those were the forms, correct? Like the form of the good would be the sort of the most abstract uh, version of good, right? And that's definitely that definitely is in contrast to number three, where something that we can experience, you know, we experience every day. Or um, the, right. Yeah. Um, so, what I would say is that I wouldn't use the word abstract. Right. Okay. Because abstract refers to a concept. It's abstract literally means when you abstract something in Latin means right. to actually pull out of. And yeah. so the way that Plato saw it, though, is that they were more like fundamental principles of reality. Okay. They, they weren't things, they weren't like concepts or things that we abstract from experience, okay. but they're actual realities that okay. we can get in touch with. Okay. Uh, yeah, so that that's that's different from like a concept or an abstraction. And um basically, I think that this view is probably the most accurate because I think that beauty, truth, and goodness are real things. They're not just concepts or judgments. And I also believe that they reflect the deepest nature of reality. And there's a reason behind this belief. And it's because uh, as a human being, I want to live the yeah. deepest life possible. And the more deeply I can understand and experience truth, beauty, and goodness, 
the deeper my life feels to be. And then I'm no longer living in a shallow, superficial, you know, kind of life, or as I like to say, living in flat land, but I'm living in a world that has real, <clears throat> excuse me, that has real depth to it. And also living in a world that's illuminated by goodness, truth, and beauty. And that's a very good place to be, uh, at least in my mind. It's like living in a non-utilitarian uh, universe. Mm -hmm. And um, I have a bit more to say about this. And uh, before I get into that, do you, do you have any other thoughts or questions that you'd like to raise about this? Um, no, I agree with what you've just said. But I, it's hard to um, to sort of quantify that you know how to live a sort of a deeper and more meaningful life like I've tried to write about this you know and it, I didn't just include sort of beautiful things but also a sense of history uh you know a sense of the the good and other things that sort of can lead to sort right. of a more fulfilling life but it's it's kind of a, it, it, for at least for me now without having thought about it a lot more it's sort of difficult to describe or to put into practice. Right. Well, um, the things that you mentioned are not contradictory to this kind of platonic I, view. It's just the platonic view is just saying that uh, in addition to there being beautiful things, there's actually some kind of reality to beauty. You know, yeah. that's, that's really what it's saying. Right, but right. Um, I've been thinking about this because, you know, we're going to have this discussion and uh, it seems to me that the Greeks had like much deeper ideas about goodness, truth, and beauty than uh, we do today. And so Plato gives all these rational arguments about this. But then in the Republic, he has this very famous metaphor of the good being represented by the sun and right. being the source of all reality. And of course, if the good is the ultimate source of reality, then it's also the goal that everything you know, aims for. Uh, and it right. implies that the world we live in is a reflection of goodness as well, which Plato believed. But if we wanted to like extend this metaphor, uh, beauty and truth are very closely allied with goodness. So uh, we could imagine them as resembling like bright rays coming from, you know, the sun of the sun of goodness, that would be a nice kind of image. But this got me thinking about how, for example, like our modern um, idea of truth is actually very shallow and how there are deeper yeah. ways of looking at the meaning of truth. Uh, and then we can talk about how beauty is connected with goodness or, or ethics, which I know is something you're very interested in. But in my view, there are much deeper ways in which we could imagine the reality of truth and the way that most modern philosophers look at truth. It's a very shallow way of looking at it because they see truth as narrowly referring to uh, a statement that is true or factual. So this is like the very simplest idea of truth. So, so Leah, you say to me, David, it's uh, raining outside. And then I go outside and look and sure enough, uh, there's water falling from the sky. And so, uh, yes, you know, what you said, is true. And we all agree about that kind of truth. But historically, there have been much uh, deeper ideas of truth um, that imply the ability to see or experience reality in a much deeper way. And one example of this is highlighted by uh, the ancient Greek word for truth, which is aletheia. And that word literally means not forgetting. So the Greek word for truth, not forgetting, can mean remembering like the true nature of things or seeing yeah. things in their true light. And that's a much deeper idea of truth than just saying it's raining or sunny outside. Right. And another thought along these lines is what if the world or reality itself is a kind of truth and that it's our task to understand yeah. and even deeply experience that truth? And I personally think that this is like an amazing way to look at the world and other yeah. philosophers have, you know, held similar views. So it doesn't eliminate the simple ideas about truth, but it does show that we can see truth in a much uh, deeper way. And uh, finally, you wanted 
to hear something about uh, the relationship between beauty and goodness. And uh, since you have a website and YouTube channel called Common Sense Ethics, it makes sense that you would wonder if beauty and ethics, you know, go together. And in ancient philosophy, they did go together. So in Plato and the Stoics, uh, you know, goodness uh, or moral goodness uh, is an important human aim. And anything that is morally good is also going to be beautiful, according to the Greeks. So that's the ancient view. Um, another thing that directly links beauty and goodness is the Greek word uh, kalon, which means beautiful. That's the Greek word for beauty, but it also means noble and honorable. And at the same time, it, it means that which is beautiful in a physical sense. And it also means that which is beautiful in a moral sense. So it carries that meaning of being morally beautiful as well. And for Plato and the Stoics, honorable actions and having a virtuous character are good, but they're also beautiful. And that probably explains uh, this ancient Stoic saying that states uh, only that which is beautiful is good. So go, if we were to go by the Greek idea of um, beauty as it relates to virtue, do you think that exposing people to beauty will all make them want to be virtuous on some level? Uh, I do. And we can talk about we can talk about that okay. a bit later, too. But okay, sure. I, I do. And, you know, I, I have, you know, reasons and arguments for for assuming that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, you mentioned in your article that we referred to earlier, um, how beauty can save the world, that proportion got left out of Plato's formula for the true, the good, and the beautiful, although it was uh, an essential component of his thought. Why was it left out? Uh, well, no one really knows for sure, but this this idea of the good, the true, and the beautiful comes from Marsilio Ficino. But Plato, Plato says in the dialogue of uh, the Philebus, uh, he says that uh, truth, beauty, goodness, and proportion are all closely related. And, and I think that's true, uh, like in the way that our hands work in the best possible way by using proportion. So there's like uh, an element of goodness in that and also beauty. Um, but what Plato actually said is this. He said, um, if we cannot catch the good with the aid of only one idea, let us run it down with three beauty, proportion, and truth. So what he's saying is that all of these concepts are very closely related. That's why I like, that's why I use that image of the sun and the rays, because it's sort of like they're all, you know, very closely related or interimminent with one another in some way. They like overlap in some way. But why did proportion get left out uh, when the Renaissance philosopher um, Marcelo Ficino came up with the formula of the good and the true, the beautiful? And uh, at the time, he was writing this commentary on this exact work of Plato. And yeah. Ficino, he was interested in proportion too, but I think he wanted to keep things simple. Right. And this is just kind of a crazy theory. But in the end, um, <laughs> I think the good, the true, and the beautiful is shorter. And it sounds very snappy. So yeah. it's like a much better marketing tagline, you know, for platonic philosophy than the good, the true, the beautiful, and the harmonious. Uh, I think it's uh, maybe as simple as that. Or, you know, maybe in his commentary, uh, he just wanted to focus on goodness, truth, right. and beauty. I mean, who really knows? But it's, it's, been, uh, it's been that that idea of the good, the true, and the beautiful. It's something that is very popular today and you know it's been right. resonating with people for you know many many years right okay so moving on would you give us some examples of how artists and architects use proportion um, and harmony to help create works of beauty and also to bring beauty into the world yes and this relates to everything we've been talking about so uh harmony and proportion, they give rise to beauty. And uh, this can actually be applied in art and architecture. And uh, this knowledge and practice was revived in the Renaissance uh, to create beautiful art and architecture. And uh, what I did is I made a short video clip giving a couple of examples of how this was done, including an analysis of how one of 
Leonardo da Vinci's paintings uh, uses harmony and proportion um, as a tool to compose uh, the painting. So uh, I'm going to add this clip to our discussion. And uh, while we watch these examples, it might be a good idea to keep in mind the Renaissance uh, definition of beauty from Leon uh, Battista Alberti, which is almost identical to the, the Greek definition. But Alberti was uh, the foremost theorist of painting and architecture in the entire Renaissance. And he called beauty uh, concinitas. And that's a Latin word, which means uh, joining things together in an elegant way, which is the same idea as harmony. And this is Alberti's exact definition of beauty. He said, uh, I define beauty to be a harmony of all the parts fitted together with such proportion and connection that nothing could be added, diminished, or altered, but for the worse. And I'm going to be teaching a five-day course on the Renaissance in Italy, and this video clip gives a small taste of what we'll be exploring in day four, which is proportion, harmony, and beauty in Renaissance art and architecture. So here's the video clip. I have a couple of examples uh, showing how harmony and proportion were used in composing Renaissance art to create an underlying sense of harmony and beauty. And uh, I have two simple examples from architecture and a more sophisticated example that shows how Leonardo da Vinci used harmony and proportion to create his first painting of the Annunciation when he was in his early 20s. So let's start with something simple, and that's a question. How do you create a perfect doorway? And what this means is, how do you determine the proportions of a doorway so that the doorway feels harmonious? What we have in this image is a Roman-style doorway. And the question is, if you're making a doorway, how would you determine the dimensions of the opening? Now, today, many people might create an opening using any measurements that they like, uh, because most designers today have nothing really to guide them. But in classical architecture, that almost never happened. Uh, traditional architects would typically use some kind of carefully considered proportion. And in this Roman doorway, we can see that the proportion used is one to two. So if the width of the door is uh, one unit, the height of the opening will be twice that. Uh, this isn't the only proportion that was ever used, but it is by far the most common. In fact, uh, in Renaissance books on architecture, uh, we can see diagrams just like this of doorways with two circles stacked on top of each other. The Renaissance architects learned how to do this because they measured the ancient Roman buildings that still survived in Rome. And that's where they discovered this one to two proportion. So this is uh, very simple to start off with. And I have a slightly more complex version of this, which is very, very beautiful. So this is an incredible photograph of a Renaissance walkway or loggia of a monastery on Lake Como in Italy that was taken by Bree Duncan. And when you look at this photo, you feel a deep sense of harmony and peace. Now, part of that is due to the lake and the wonderful setting, but part of it comes from the harmony and beauty of the architecture itself. The architecture projects beauty and harmony because of the underlying proportions on which it is based. And we can see those proportions in this image. And it's exactly the same proportions, uh, one to two, as the Roman doorway we just looked at. And at the top of the arch, the arch itself is defined by the circle. And below the circle, we have a square with the same height and width of the circle. So what makes this different is that 
there's a little wall at the base and the square is divided into thirds. And as you can see, the height of the wall is exactly one third the height of the square. So this architecture is perfectly defined by the proportions of the underlying geometry. And that is the primary reason why the architecture itself radiates a feeling of beauty and harmony. And finally, we'll look at Leonardo da Vinci's painting of the Annunciation, which he created when he was in his early 20s. And we know that Leonardo was interested in geometry and mathematics his entire life. But the question here is, why did Leonardo design the Annunciation in a perfect root 5 rectangle? Now, a root 5 rectangle is a rectangle that has a proportion of 1 to the square root of 5. And while that might sound complicated, it's actually very simple to construct because all you need is a straight edge or a ruler and a compass. And all you do is draw a square and then create arcs from the corners, which give you the root 5 rectangle. But let's take a look at what this actually gives you. So you start with a square and then you put your compass in the bottom of the square, right in the center of the square. And then you draw a semicircle that connects the two top corners of the square, and that gives you the root 5 rectangle. It's as simple as that. But you also get some other things when you do that. First of all, the square and the rectangle on the right together create a golden rectangle based on the golden ratio, or the phi ratio. So if the side of the square is 1, the ratio of the rectangle is 1 to 1.618034 dot dot dot. And similarly, uh, you get a mirror of this golden rectangle going in the opposite direction. But at the same time, you get two smaller golden rectangles on each side of the square, and these both have the same ratio. They also have the proportion of 1 to 1.618034. So yes, mathematics can be wonderful. And as we can see, Leonardo used this exact geometry to create a harmonious composition for the Annunciation. But there's even more to this because the entire painting is composed using this proportion of the golden ratio. So in this image, we've moved the central square of the geometry to frame the Virgin Mary. And we'll see why this is part of the original design a bit later. And that gives us the two vertical golden rectangles on the left, centered on the angel Gabriel. In addition to this, we've divided the vertical height of the painting by the golden ratio, as shown by the two orange dots. This defines the height of the wall in the background, and it also defines the axis of activity in the painting like a laser beam. And it defines the placement of the hands of the angel and the Virgin Mary. In fact, the placement of the three hands highlighted here is also determined by the golden ratio. Or to put it another way, the placement of the hands defines the division of a line into the golden ratio or the divine proportion. So there is a lot of divine activity going on in this painting. And this is what we're left with. The Virgin is in a perfect square. This is a golden rectangle. And this is a golden rectangle too. And this horizontal rectangle is also a golden rectangle. And this is a golden rectangle too. And finally, if we add back the original geometry that defines the dimensions of the painting, we can see the full design behind the composition. As you can see, the entire composition 
is made of squares and golden rectangles. And the large square that contains the Virgin Mary contains two golden rectangles. You should be able to recognize them by now. But it also contains two squares, a smaller square and a larger one. And the ratio of the smaller square to the larger square is also the precise ratio of the golden section or the golden ratio. And what makes this so important is that the entire composition is harmonically composed using the single ratio of the golden section or the golden ratio. And this is the exact meaning of the Greek word symmetry or symmetria, which was the goal of ancient architects and designers. Symmetria means that an entire structure is harmonized by a common ratio or proportion, which is exactly what Leonardo achieved here, and which was also the goal of other Renaissance artists and architects. So, when we look at the painting, we can sense and truly feel the fact that it embodies a radiant sense of beauty and harmony, even if we can't see the actual proportions and mathematical harmonies behind it with our eyes. The harmony is still there. It's guiding the entire work, adding to its radiance, harmony, and beauty. So this this goes back to my question a few minutes ago about how beauty in the physical environment can help us to develop um, internal moral and intellectual and intellectually as well internally morally and intellectually and if so how do you think that that is okay uh, I definitely think that's possible and there are a lot of different ways that we can look at it but one way is that. Uh, for 200,000 years, human beings uh, co-evolved with the beauty of the natural world. Uh, so to live in a beautiful environment is part of our evolutionary history. And really, it's our natural state, it, and it helps us to thrive as human beings. We are designed that way. Um, and if we're forced to live in a truly ugly environment, say like a cement cell, totally you know, devoid of beauty and without any windows or something like that, it would be extremely harmful, you know, for our inner life and development. And that's because, you know, we human beings are part of nature and we're part of the living world, which is beautiful. And if we're separated from the experience of beauty, we'll be alienated not only from the world, but from our own deepest nature. And uh, there have been different scientific studies showing that human beings thrive and do better work in, you know, like beautiful environments or when they have views of nature from their offices. But I'm not going to really discuss those studies now because I think the reasons for this should be, you know, pretty obvious, you know, from the earlier comments that uh, right. that it's part of our nature to be connected with a world and a cosmos that right. is permeated by beauty. Right. That makes sense to me. Do you think that there is a connection of beauty to the divine or spiritual? And does contemplation of nature or beauty enhance what it means to be alive or enrich the spirit in some way? Okay. Well, um, I think that there is a uh, connection there. For example, in the past, philosophers used to discuss philosophy in beautiful settings like gardens or other inspiring spots. Right. And those beautiful settings have a tendency to elevate our minds and make us feel connected with the world. Uh, they're very different from the depressing kinds of uh, university classrooms we have today, uh, you know, which sometimes uh, are without windows and resemble jail cells, not all Cinder of them. Block, uh... Cinder block, exactly. That's exactly what I had in mind, you know, bringing back all these memories from being in college. Yeah, at so, least uh, some of our college buildings were definitely cinder block. Yeah, oh, definitely. <laughs> I, I mean, uh, all of uh, 
the ones I can remember in uh, Michigan, at least, were. But um, in my experience, uh, places like that are not really the best ones uh, for learning. They don't really like bring out the best in us. Uh, and I think that being in a beautiful setting helps us to deepen our thinking. But another perspective on this is that beauty can help us experience and even understand the world more deeply by catching a glimpse of the world's deeper order. Yeah. And I think you could describe this deeper way of seeing and knowing as being like a spiritual experience. So uh, I have a couple of quotes about this. The first observation is from the biologist uh, Gregory Bateson. And this isn't an exact quote, but it's a paraphrase of his ideas from his book called Mind and Nature. And uh, what he's saying is that uh, we are parts of a living world, but we've lost the sense of the unity between human beings and the biosphere, which would reassure us all with an affirmation of beauty. And uh, this is the part that I just really loved. He said that uh, this is significant because the aesthetic unity of nature reveals an ultimate unifying pattern far deeper and more complete than the findings of quantitative science can describe. So that's a very Pythagorean way of looking at beauty and nature, that it's a reflection of this deeper order. And it's, it's, it, it transcends even, you know, the powers of, of science to, you know, quantify the reality. Uh, another quotation that's very similar to this comes from uh, the philosopher Goethe, who put it very well. And Goethe said that uh, the beautiful is a manifestation of secret laws of nature, which without its presence would have never been revealed. So he's saying that like beauty reveals to us the underlying reality of nature and its laws. And if we didn't have access to beauty, we would never uh, realize that deeper nature of reality. Yeah, that's very profound. I was just sorry. I was I was lost in thought for a moment. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Well, it's very. In I mean, it's. It, it, I mean, uh, th this really goes outside the scope of modern philosophy because, you know, when have you heard a modern philosophy s saying that the experience of beauty could actually be? a gateway to knowing and understanding the deep structure of the world. That's just not the way that modern philosophers think, but I, I think right. that's absolutely true. I think, I think, right. uh, you know, we need to have, um, you know, wider and more, you know, encompassing ideas in, in modern philosophy, which is really quite trivial and, you know, over-specialized dealing with, uh, a lot of insignificant matters that don't really relate to human life. Right. Right. There are, well, there are a lot of sort of more popular books though, about like the nature cure or the enchanted life. And I'm just going from memory here though, about sort of how we can have a transcendent experience through nature. So maybe even if a lot of, if not a lot of philosophers are exploring that there have been that, you know, I think a, a probably five or six interesting books about that within the last decade, at least when it comes to sort of nature and our connection with it. Right. Know, and uh, the reason people write those kinds of books is because, um, you know, for different reasons, that yeah. kind of connection has been overlooked or eclipsed in the modern world. So that's like a response you right. know, to the situation we find ourselves in. Right. 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 So, well, drawing on that, what do you think is the most direct way we can draw on beauty to improve human life? Okay. Well, uh, I'm quite sure that the answer to that would be to create more beautiful architecture uh, because of all the different kinds of art. Architecture has the most uh, direct influence on our lives. And architects used to study harmony and proportion. This was like the core curriculum, really, you know, to create beautiful buildings, but for the most part, uh, that knowledge is no longer taught in architecture schools. So uh, we now have a world filled with uh, steel and glass skyscrapers. Um, 
and also filled with badly proportioned buildings covered with vinyl and aluminum siding in the United States. But not really. Don't say that. I live in a house that has vinyl siding. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not trying to pick on you here. But um, this isn't really. This isn't true in Europe, right. though. And yeah. um, it, it strikes me as now. I, I know why people do that. I, I know why people right, do that right. way. But it strikes me as being a bit soulless. And that was uh, one of the reasons I actually moved to Europe from the United States was to surround myself with like more beautiful buildings, like made out of stone. Right. And, no, I like stone. Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> I like stone. But Europe has on to a lesser extent, though, the same problem once you're outside of the city centers and the historic areas, you know, where you'll have like concrete block apartment buildings and things like that. So, so it's a problem everywhere. But yeah, the United, it's probably worse in the United States. Right. Um, yeah. Because there's like a lot of, you know, cookie cutter construction and, you know, it's all mechanized and everything like that. And you don't have a sense that you're connecting with like the past, you know, or something right. that's like, like really solid and has uh, like something behind it, you know, in terms of of history. But um, I did I did move here um you know, to a place where they're, the buildings are made out of stone and they have classical elements and things like that. And in my experience, it does make you feel happier and more content and more at peace at the world. You know, right. at least that was right. my experience. Right. <laughs> now go on with what you were saying. <laughs> okay. So I think you wanted to discuss the uh, the film that Roger Scruton made about uh, why beauty matters. Right. Okay. Well, if you're finished with that, with that question, before we move on, I was just going to say, yeah, I agree with you completely about architecture. Right. But if we apply sort of the stoic criterion to that, um, the architecture that we're met with is sort of out of our control. Do you know what I mean? Mm, so right, it's like, uh-huh. right. So without sort of a sea change, you know, on a, a level that you know, I, that we aren't really influencing, like, you know, there's, there's definitely prominent people like Roger Scruton, or you said a King Charles who were interested in that and maybe in a position to make some kind of difference in terms of architecture. But I don't know how we can, what we, how much we can do about that. So -hmm. there must be other things that we can do, even if we have really ugly architecture, you know, like maybe adding gardens or planting trees, things like that. Cause I was reading, there was an interesting article about some um, people in who are living in sort of an impoverished part of Chicago in a really ugly block, probably with row houses or something like that. And they formed a committee to plant gardens and plant trees. And that just that alone sort of increased people's sense of civic responsibility and, you know, um, how they reacted to the landscape. So I think things like that um, might be helpful, you know, in lieu of being able to sort of have no control over the architecture that we're faced with. Right. Yeah. Oh, I, I totally agree because right. uh, there are a lot of ways that, you know, we can create more beautiful environments right. and uh, right. whenever we do that in whatever way, you know, we choose to, or we're, we're able to, that will be beneficial right. in some way. Um, the reason I mentioned architecture though, is that it has such a huge impact on people. And right. so we're talking about, uh, you know, if we were to create changes in architecture, you know, that's something that could take decades. Yeah. But it doesn't mean it's not a good project. I mean, um, right. when right, the right. Renaissance humanists came up with the idea of the Renaissance, they had essentially a plan to create a Renaissance, but it took a few decades for it to, you know, be fully realized. So whatever we can do to uh, enhance the world with beauty is something that will, uh, I think, pay a lot of very good right. dividends in terms of our well-being and happiness. Right. Arthur, do you know if there are any schools that specifically teach sort of classical architectural principles or any idea? Um, I'm sure that there are. And there's a uh, association for classical architecture in the United States. 
Uh, it's a national organization, but they're based in New York and they have a lot of good seminars and things like that. So there are, there are definitely people that carry on this tradition, but uh, we tend not to hear about them. You have to, you have to look for them, but the truth is out there. So (laughs) if you get on Google and start looking for classical architecture, uh, you will be able to find schools and, you know, associations that, you know, foster that kind of learning. Oh, and you, okay. So you had mentioned Roger Scruton, who at the end of his life was very involved in sort of, um, you know, the cre- creating more beautiful architecture in the UK. And um, and now he made uh, a film in 2009, a documentary film, Why Beauty Matters. And in that he argues that in the modern world, we are losing beauty. And do you think that's true? And if so, why? Yeah, well, I definitely think it's true, um, especially in the world of art, which gave up on beauty a long time ago. And often now it celebrates, you know, ugliness and just, you know, the egotism of artists. And uh, one turning point in that kind of melodrama was uh, in 1917 when uh, Marcel Duchamp put a urinal on display in a museum and called it art. Now, Scruton included that in his film. Right. But, uh, you know, once you're able to uh, create art like that, uh, with no real knowledge or discipline required, art as a field, I think, will go into a steep decline, which is, you know, probably, you know, what we've seen. And uh, if people uh, do get a chance, I I, I do think uh, they should try and watch this documentary by Roger Scruton. Right that was made for the BBC. It's called Why Beauty Matters, and you can find it online. Uh, It originally came out in 2009, but it's really a gem. And uh, I wish it had been available back when I was a philosophy professor, because it would have been a great discussion piece, you know, to like show in class. But uh, one of the most important things in Scruton's film I think is his observation that beautiful buildings are well-preserved and cared for because people really treasure them. And on the other hand, ugly buildings, which are only built to be useful in the worst sense of that word, you know, very functional and utilitarian. um, Those are the first buildings to be abused and abandoned. And uh, that's because they're ugly and they don't help people feel like they're really at home in the world, you know, because we do have this need for for beauty which makes us feel connected to the, the the world of which we're a part and i know this to be a fact because um yeah based on my personal experience here so i've been living in you know the european city of sarajevo for like 12 years now and i live in the old part of town uh that has a lot of beautiful buildings and uh, some from like ottoman and the austro-hungarian periods and they're just like real treasures and uh some of these buildings are like 500 years old and people in this part of town, you know, with, with the beautiful old buildings, they, they feel a kind of moral sense uh, not to harm the buildings. But if you go to like the modern parts of the city and look at like the very ugly concrete slab buildings, which were built during the era of communism, um, this was like a communist state back then. And that's when this kind of architecture became very popular here. You'll find that most of those buildings, um, they're poorly designed, they're very unattractive, and they're all covered with graffiti. Right. And so I think what's happening at uh, at least an unconscious level is that people realize these buildings are not real homes, and they have no love or respect for them, and they don't feel at home in them. So those are the first buildings to be covered with graffiti. So, uh, of course. So, yeah. No, Communist but, architecture is horrible. I went to um, to Leipzig mm-hmm. and, you know, which was also Eastern Germany, you know, former communist bloc. And uh, there was a section of the city where all the former, well, former communist government buildings were, and they were all completely abandoned. You know, they might as yes. well have been in yes. peace. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, I remember seeing it. Yeah, and just to go back to um, Duchamp's urinal, I think that, <laughs> you know, how he took a urinal and called it, called it art. The distinction that you make actually is really important because you said that basically someone can just take something without any discipline 
whatsoever and call it art. Whereas if you think about classical art, um, like it probably takes decades for someone to create something like the David statue or, you know, to hone their craft and really become, yes. I mean, just to take something that's manufactured that you haven't, all he did was sign it, right. You know, or some, you know, he's already put someone's name on it and um, you know, he didn't even make that himself. So it's like, is that, you have to really, is that really art? You know, it's at least it doesn't create, maybe it is, but I mean, people can debate that, but it takes basically no discipline or talent right. to create something like that. It doesn't take study. It doesn't take, you know, time to learn and to perfect, you know, your craft. And I, I, that's a, an important distinction, I think, is when we think of an artist, we don't really think of someone sort of, at least I don't, just pulling something out of some mundane item out of thin air and saying that, <laughs> okay, this is art. You know, we think of a painting or something that someone probably had to spend at least some time, you know, to learn how to do. Exactly. So. Yeah. And, you know, fortunately, there are still people who know how to produce beautiful art and architecture, but their number is few and they're not really celebrated uh, in our culture. But the people who produce ugly work, you know, to shock others, I mean, oftentimes like putting a, a urinal in a museum why would you do that you would do it to shock people really or people who create you know like these meaningless uh, installations and pass them off as real art those yeah. are the people who get all the attention today so i think that's that's a bit sad yeah i'm sorry i interrupted you what were you going to say before we move on to the final oh, no that, that that's that's all that i had to say about that yeah. okay um, so you had mentioned your upcoming course in Italy. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about that and what you'll um, plan to cover? Sure. Well, um, I've actually studied the Renaissance uh, my entire adult life, and I'm working full time on it now because uh, it's not very widely known um, by a lot yeah. of people how or why the Renaissance came into being. And there was an actual kind of program behind it. But basically, the Renaissance was the offspring of the Renaissance humanists who wanted to change their world. And their goal was to uh, recover the knowledge, arts, and moral philosophy of ancient Rome and Greece in order to, you know, create a better world. And surprisingly, they were pretty successful at that, at least for a while. And uh, that strikes me as being very timely in our world today. So, uh, I've created a new website called Living Ideas Journal, and I've also created something called the Renaissance Program, which offers a five-day course in uh, Florence, Italy, where the Renaissance began. And uh, if you go to the Living Ideas Journal website, you'll find like a link on the homepage to the course. But the course itself, it's called uh, Creating the Best Possible World, uh, the Energizing Ideas of the Italian Renaissance. And it's basically about the ideas that helped to create the Renaissance, uh, which people are very unlikely to learn about in school. And anyone can read about the course on the website. But uh, I think what makes this really unique is that like each morning over the course of five days, there's a two hour slide lecture uh, that explores Renaissance ideas. And then after that, the participants uh, visit different historical sites in Florence, often like museums and artworks, to see with their own eyes how these ideas were applied and how those ideas changed the world during the Renaissance. So what I basically tried to do is uh, design a very immersive course where the ideas of Renaissance humanism uh, could come together with uh, the city of Florence and all its treasures to create what I hope you know, would be an unforgettable experience for the people that participate in it. So is it coming I'm out looking at cold? this is like my last big project in yeah. life. <laughs> I want to do this for, you know, the next decade and yeah. really show how a lot of um, these very good ideas and values that they had in the Renaissance could be applied in our world today uh, to create, to create a, um, more vibrant, meaningful, and satisfying world. Well, that sounds great. You know, I, I wish you the best of luck with it. I'm sure it'll be wonderful for those who can attend. This has been a, a great discussion. Thank you so much. We finally um, got together and did this. We had to postpone several times 
And uh, I think it's been very good. So thank you so much. It's really great speaking with you. And um, I think that uh, this is an important topic, uh, creating, you know, uh, a more vibrant and beautiful world, uh, you know, which is just like one aspect of, you know, the Renaissance. But uh, it's been great speaking with you. And uh, thanks for, you know, taking on what I think is a very important idea. Yeah, thank you so much. This has been great. Take care. Okay, sounds good. Talk to you later.